Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in today's presentation we're going to be continuing with sedimentary rocks. So this is sedimentary rocks part two, part two, just to be confusing. Okay, let's get going. So in the previous presentation we dealt with some of the classic continental and transitional environments. So we had to think about you know what they look like, what type of sediments we would expect to find, what kind of textures we would expect to find in the rocks. So obviously the final group of the main depositional environments are of course the marine environments. So now we're going to think about the, 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 the classic environments we can get in marine environments. And if you remember, a marine environment is an environment that spends its entire time submerged underwater. Okay, so marine environments include the continental shelf, the continental slope, the continental rise, the deep sea floor, which is also called the abyssal plain, and carbonate shells. Carbonate shells is a term for the, the group of slightly different environments that essentially constitute you know, these large carbonate forming systems. One of the classic examples, of course, would be a reef. So in terms of the first four environments, what we're looking at are we're looking at environments which are dominated by clastic sediments. So we're going to have material which is being eroded from the continents and it ends up being deposited onto the marine environment, into the marine environment. And it will begin to work its way across the continental shelf. It will get to the edge of the continental shelf. Then some of it will slide down the continental slope and it will come to rest at the bottom of the continental slope, which essentially is referred to as the continental rise. And I've got some diagrams coming which will demonstrate this. So... In the marine environment, we also have sediments which are formed by organic and chemical methods. So, of course, we have limestones, which are mostly of biogenic origin. And we have evaporites, which are, of course, the result of the evaporation of water. In terms of limestones and evaporites, both of these will form in shallow marine environments. Okay, so here we go. So we're here in the marine environment. And in terms of the marine environment itself, it's split into these broad areas. So we have the continental shelf. So this area is underlain by uh, continental crust and the water depth is typically between 0 and 200 metres, so quite shallow. So that's the kind of water depth uh, through which light can penetrate, providing the water isn't too cloudy. Now when we come to the edge of the continental shelf, we have the shelf break and then you go down the continental slope. So the continental slope is essentially the edge of the continental crust. It can vary in angle. Typically, it's quite steep, anywhere between 40 and 90 degrees. So, obviously, because it's quite a steep environment, material doesn't settle on the continental slope. It merely passes through it. So, material is going to come off the continental shelf, across the shelf break. It's going to come down the continental slope. And then whatever material comes flowing down the continental slope is obviously then going to hit the continental rise. So the continental rise is this raised area here at the bottom of the continental slope. And the continental rise is con essentially consists of material that falls off the continental shelf, comes down the slope, and it comes to rest as part of the continental rise. And then finally out here, we have the abyssal plain environments. And this is a very, very deep sea environment. This is an environment with very, very low rates of sedimentation. So... These are our basic areas. Now, of course, we also have carbonate shelves and we have evaporites. But those two environments will tend to be located within specific areas of the continental shelf where specific conditions are met. The vast majority of the marine environment is going to be dominated by clastic sediments, so material that's being eroded from the continents and deposited into the ocean basins. Okay, so let's start with the detrital marine environment. And of course, the first one is the continental shelf. That's between 0 and 200 metres water depth, underlain by continental crust, as I just mentioned. And the shelf is broadly split into two distinct regions. The first is the inner higher energy portion. Now, this is the part that's going to be closest to the coastline. And this area is being periodically stirred up by wave action and tidal currents. So this means the sediment in this area is being moved around quite actively. So what this means is lighter material like silt and clay can get picked up by all this moving water and it can pull out that fine material and take it off into deeper water. 
Now this means that this higher energy inner portion is dominated by sands on the whole. Sometimes if it's very, very high energy, it can be dominated by gravels and cobbles, but most of the time it's dominated by sand. And so what you'll get, because we have these very strong tidal flows and wave-related processes, you'll tend to get lots of large crossbeds. So we'll have these marine sand dunes, so big sand dunes that form underwater and which are being moved around by the tidal currents. And the bedding planes between layers of rock which had formed in this system will typically have wave-formed ripples. That's symmetrical ripples to you and me because of course the, the, the to and fro of the water is going to produce a bi-directional current which will produce symmetrical ripples. Obviously this area will have lots of marine fossils and there will be lots of bioturbation so we expect lots of burrows. We also expect that because this is such a high energy area lots of the marine fossils will show some degree of disarticulation. They'll be a bit broken up because they will be pushed around by the water. Okay, so this diagram here is showing you that the general breakdown of the continental shelf. So we have the higher energy inner portion here marked out in yellow, which is dominated by sand. And then as we head out further, things begin to become a lot more stable. The energy decreases and we move into an environment which is dominated by muds. Now the transition between the higher energy inner portion and the lower energy mud dominated outer portion can either be a sharp boundary in which case in the rock record we would see intertugging, that zigzag pattern, which we've discussed in a couple, of, a couple of lectures ago. Or if the transition is gradational, you will see a gradual change in composition with the sediment steadily becoming more and more muddy. So the thing is, is the water out here is now quite still. And because it's not moving very much, this of course means that the very fine material which is held in suspension, the clays and the silts, can now begin to drop out of suspension and settle out onto the seafloor. Now this means that what we get is we get a, a very mud dominated sediment that tends to have uh, laminations. So because of course the sediment is dropping out slowly, we tend to get these nice fine layers. Obviously, we're going to have lots of marine fossils, which will tend to be in better condition because the water is nowhere near as active. And we will have lots of bioturbation, so lots and lots of burrows. Now, another thing that can happen, given the correct conditions, is that because the silt and the clay is now leaving the water column and settling out onto the seafloor, what we can actually get is we can get very, very good quality, nice, clear seawater right here at the edge of the continental shelf. And this means that if conditions are correct, this is the area in which we will form reefs, so coral reefs. So the conditions we need are clear water, which is obviously achieved by the silt and clay leaving the water column, shallow water, that's between zero and 200 meters water depth, so the continental shelf, warm water, corals tend not to like uh, cold water so we're we're typically looking for a warm water environment and we'll typically find that 30 degrees north or south of the equator. Another thing which is always very helpful is that our sea water has a normal salinity because most reef dwelling organisms don't like it when the water gets too salty. So if we are in the right conditions so if we have clear water, shallow water, warm water with normal salinity and we're 30 degrees north or south of the equator, the extreme outer margin of the continental shelf can produce carbonates. Okay, but that's dependent on these conditions being met. Otherwise, your normal continental shelf, so think of the east coast of the United States, you would have a sand dominated environment which would then transition into a mud dominated environment. Okay, so what about the slope and the rise? Well, most of the sediment that enter the marine, enters the marine environment will eventually cross the continental shelf and it will go over the shelf slope break, which is also sometimes just referred to as the shelf break. So of course, if you remember, that's this line right here that marks the edge of the continental shelf. And once you go across it, you're then coming down the continental slope. So uh, the sediments will work their way down the continental slope and of course they'll come to rest at the bottom of the continental slope which is called the continental rise. So the sediment moves down the continental slope typically along uh, submarine canyons 
Okay, so if we go back to this image here, you can see here we have a submarine canyon, which just forms a natural pathway along which sediment will move. So sediment that gets essentially stirred up here on the continental shelf, it will get channeled down the submarine canyon, and the sediment will obviously come to rest at the bottom of the continental slope, which is the continental rise. So the sediments move down the slope as turbidity current. So we, of course, discussed those in the previous lecture, so we know what they are now. So this means that our sediment is going to end up forming a sequence of overlapping submarine fans. So if we go back two slides, here's a nice example of a submarine fan deposit, because, of course, these, you know, these, these, slump, these slumps of material coming down the continental slope, they don't just happen once. It happens again and again and again. And so this means you're going to have fan on top of fan on top of fan. And, and this is the material that the continental rise is made from. All of this very mud rich with a little bit of sandy material that just comes to settle at the bottom of the continental slope. So, of course, these fans consist of five distinct layers, which, we, of course, we refer to as the boomer sequence. Once again, a couple of lectures ago, we discussed boomer sequences. And the continental rise is a combination of these fan deposits and the occasional debris flow. Debris flow just means underwater landslide. So a lot of this material here, which makes up the continental rise, will be dominated by muds with a little bit of sand. You will tend to have these boomer sequences, which shows you you have these uh, turbidite deposits. And you will occasionally get a chaotic deposit, essentially, which is a debris flow, which is just produced when a bit of the continental slope just drops off and just slumps down onto the continental rise. So we have a mixture of both turbidite deposits and underwater landslide deposits. In terms of the turbidites themselves, obviously they produce these submarine fans, and we know that these submarine fans will show normal grading. So when you look at the boomer sequence, you have very sand-rich material at the bottom, and that grades through silts to clays, and of course so the top layer of your boomer sequence is dominated by clay, so you have an upward fining sequence. Where you have these uh, underwater landslide deposits, these debris flows, you can, in some circumstances, get inverse grading. So that would mean you would have the finest material at the bottom of the layer and the coarsest material at the top. But that doesn't happen all the time. In terms of the submarine fans themselves, which are produced by the turbidites, well, the size of the fan will vary depending on how much mud there is in the sediment, which is slumping down the continental slope. So if you look at these diagrams here, the thing you'll notice is the more sand rich your turbidity current is, the smaller your fan will be. The more mud rich the material is, the larger the fan will be. So if we look here, so we're here we're in the Bay of Bengal, so you can see in this area we do of course have the Ganges uh, exiting into the Indian Ocean. And of course, what we have here is we have this absolutely gargantuan fan right there. And this is all this very fine muddy material which is being dumped into the marine environment by the Ganges. So the more mud rich your fan is, the further it will go. And you can see that this fan is absolutely massive. So obviously we know we have these turbidity currents, so we can see the boomer sequences in the rock record. And we've also drilled uh, cores through modern boomer sequences, so modern turbidite flows to see what they look like now. And so we know what we're looking at. So the question then becomes is, well, what actually causes these turbidite flows? Because when you think about it, if your sediment is sitting happily here on the continental shelf, why would it go down the continental slope? So there's typically three main reasons which will trigger a turbidity current, so cause material to come off, this, off the shelf and go down the slope. The first one is earthquakes, of course. So obviously on the continental shelf, you're going to have lots of relatively loosely consolidated material. It's going to have lots of water mixed in with the sediment. And so if you start shaking that material even gently, that can be sufficient to cause a slump, a landslide, essentially, which will turn into a turbidity current. So the first option is earthquakes. The next option is slope collapse. So typically what could happen is you can have a buildup of sediment here on the edge of the continental shelf. And if that layer of sediment reaches a set angle, which is called the angle of repose, 
that's the angle, or should I say the maximum angle at which your sediment is stable. So if you've ever been to the beach and built a sandcastle, you'll know that as you, you know, uh, as you put more and more sand into your sandcastle, eventually you'll start to see sand sliding down the side. And this is because you've exceeded or, re or reached or exceeded the angle of repose. So once you go past the angle of repose, essentially the sand doesn't have enough cohesion to hold itself together, and so it naturally slides. And the same will go for marine sediments. So if you have a buildup of marine sediments on the edge here, and the angle, so the angle of repose gets too steep, then those sediments will naturally begin to slump. They'll slide. And of course, this material will then start its slide and it will come down the continental slope. The, th the final option are strong storms. So we've already discussed how this sand-rich inner portion is constantly being churned up by tides and waves. The mud-rich, more low-energy outer portion, on the other hand, is a more stable environment. However, every once in a while, a big storm will come through. And this will mean that the water out here on the edge of the continental shelf, which is normally nice and peaceful, will start to get churned up quite strongly in some cases. And this will encourage material to move across the shelf and just naturally flow down the continental slope. So turbidity currents tend to be caused by either earthquakes, slope collapse, or strong storms. And so I think we've pretty much covered the environments that we have here. So we have the continental shelf, which consists of the sand-rich high-energy inner shelf and the lower-energy mud-rich outer shelf. We have the shelf break, the continental slope, and then we have the buildup of material at the bottom of the continental slope, which we refer to as the continental rise. So what about the deep, deep ocean? Well, the thing is, if we just go back, actually, as I said, a lot of the material that gets you know, eroded from the continent ends up in the ocean. A lot of that will slowly work its way across the shelf and it will slide down the slope and come to rest on the continental rise. The abyssal plain itself is out even further in deeper water and it doesn't receive huge amounts of sediment. So it's an area of very, very low rates of sediment deposition. So you have to bear that in mind. So the deep sea floor is covered by fine grain deposits, which are referred to as pelagic sediments. The exception are mid-Atlantic ridges, because of course at mid-Atlantic ridges we have new crust being made. And of course, as it's new crust, it doesn't have it hasn't had time for a layer of sediment to build up on top of it. So at spreading ridges, we have fresh exposed oceanic crust. Everywhere else in the deep ocean is going to be covered by these pelagic sediments. So in terms of the deep marine environment, sands, gravels, cobbles, boulders, almost completely absent. We're dealing with an environment which is dominated by muds, so silts and clays, and to be perfectly honest, most of the class will be clay-sized. You can sometimes get bands of coarser material, so sands and gravels, in the deep ocean, but they will be related to ice rafting, so icebergs. So if you have a large piece of ice, so Greenland, Antarctica, and of course that ice is full of pieces of rock, well of course when pieces of ice break off the edge of the ice sheet and they go rafting off in the form of icebergs, as they melt they will deposit these coarse pieces of sediment as they go. And so if we look where are we? I'm going to skip forward. Here we go. So if we look at this diagram here, this is showing you the distribution of different types of deep marine sediments. We are interested in these glacial marine sediments in this kind of, you know, peachy color. Well, here you go. You can see they occur right here along the edge of Antarctica. And you actually also get them occurring here along the coastline of Greenland, but they're not actually in this particular diagram. And that's simply because you've got ice rafting off the edge of the ice sheet here and depositing these coarse sediments as it melts. But in the vast majority of cases, what you're going to see in, in these deep ocean sediments is pretty much a clay dominated environment. So pelagic sediments are split into three main groups. You have the siliceous oozes, the calcareous oozes, and what are referred to as the red clays, which are also called pelagic clays. So an ooze consists of greater or equal, well, equal to or greater than 30% calcareous or siliceous planktonic debris. 
So if you remember, we've we've discussed briefly how there are little photosynthesizing organisms and there are also little zoo uh, plankton as well, so predatory plankton, which are floating around at the top of the water column, so near the ocean surface. And lots of these different organisms will have shells, and the shells can even be made of calcium carbonate, in which case the shell is calcareous, or it can be made of silica, SiO2, in which case the shell is silicious. So in the ocean you have, you know, trillions of these little organisms and of course they die and so what will happen is obviously when they die the uh, the organic portion will rot away however the shell will not and it will steadily sink over time and eventually it will settle on the seafloor and these organisms live across the entire surface of the ocean and so this means that even in areas where you're a very, very long way from the coastline, you will still have these animals in large abundance living right at the top of the water column. And of course, they will die and their shells will slowly drop to the seafloor and they will get incorporated into the deep marine sediments. So obviously, uh, calcareous oozes. I've, I've written carbonaceous there for some reason. What I should have written is calcareous. My mistake. I apologize. So calcareous oozes contain calcareous shells, so calcium carbonate shells, and silicious oozes contain silicious shells. So it just depends on what type of uh, organism you have dominating in that environment. So if you have something like diatomes dominating, diatomes have shells which are made of silica, SiO2, well in that case you're going to get a silica, uh, you're going to get a silicious ooze if they're there in large enough quantities. On the other hand, if you have something like foraminifera, foraminifera tend to have shells made of calcium carbonate. And so in that instance, if you have foraminifera present in large quantities, you're going to get a calcareous ooze. Now, the remainder of the sediment, so that's up to 70%, is going to be clay. Or should I say clay-sized clasts. Now, the accumulation rate for these, uh, these silicious and calcareous oozes is extremely low. So a calcareous ooze will typically have a accumulation rate of between 0.3 and 5 centimeters per uh, f f f let's try again between 0.3 and 5 centimeters per thousand years, and a silicious ooze will have an accumulation rate of between 0.2 and 1 centimeter per thousand years. So these are very very slow rates of accumulation. So what we have here are a couple of pictures. So this top one here is a calcareous ooze from the North Sea. So the North Sea is the body of water to the east of the United Kingdom. And as you can quite clearly see, what we have here is we have a sediment which is dominated by little bits of shell fragments. You can see one right here. It looks almost like a, a wheel with spokes. You can see another one down here. You can see another one here. So these are called uh, coccoliths. They're plates of, made of calcium carbonate. And they, are, they cover the, uh, an organism called a coccolithophore. Okay. And so when that organism dies, the, the plates which make up the shell, which are like you know the pieces of metal that make up a suit of armor, separate from one another and they rain down onto the seafloor. And you can see that this particular picture here, which is a scanning electron image, uh, should I say scanning electron microscope image, is absolutely stuffed with these plates. So this particular sediment is definitely greater than 30% uh, calcareous material. So this is going to be a calcareous ooze. If we look down here, on the other hand, we have a sediment which is dominated by clays. So you can see it almost looks like, you know, pages in a book, doesn't it? And that's because clay minerals are naturally platy. They're, they're like tiny pieces of paper in terms of their shape. They're very thin, but very broad. And so what happens is, is as these clay minerals essentially settle on one another and, you know, they get orientated as the sediment gets compacted, you get this very, very fine layering. And so you can see the difference here between a calcareous ooze and a pelagic clay quite clearly. So pelagic clays obviously dominated by clay sized material. In contrast, uh, calcareous oozes and silicious oozes will, be, will have a significant component of shelly material mixed in there. And these shells, though, they're going to be tiny. They're not the kind of shells you can really see with the naked eye. These are going to be microscopic structures. So calcareous shell organisms on the whole are more common in the oceans, which explains the higher accumulation rate because there's just more calcareous shell fragments in the oceans in, as a whole. 
In terms of the uh, more silica rich organisms, they tend to prefer colder water. So you tend to get more silicious oozes towards the poles. Now, the red clays, also called pelagic clays, accumulate in the very, very deepest portions of the, portions of the oceans, and their accumulation rate is extremely low, 0.1 to 0.5 centimetres per thousand years. So it takes a very, very long time for them to build up. Obviously, they contain less than 30% biogenic material, so they're going to have less than 30% silicious or calcareous shells. Obviously, if they had greater than 30%, you'd be looking at a silicious or calcareous ooze. In terms of the material that makes up these uh, pelagic clays, you have a mixture of wind-blown desert uh, material. So we've discussed how uh, in a desert environment like the Sahara, the wind will pick up very, very light material, mostly silts and clays, and the wind will transport that very light material a long way away from the desert. And sometimes that wind, which contains all this clay and silt, will go out over the ocean. And as the wind is moving across the ocean, it will drop some of that fine material as it goes. And so obviously those silts and clays will enter the water column and slowly over time settle down on, settle out onto the seafloor. Obviously, you just have clay minerals, which can be contributed by rivers. So we've also discussed how if you have a river that's you know, it's fresh water, the fresh water is naturally um, has a lower density than, than uh, salt water. And so when your river deposits that fresh water into the ocean basin, the fresh water will naturally move across the surface of the ocean, and sometimes for quite large distances. And in some cases, some of this very clay-rich, you know, fresh water can make it out quite, quite far from the coastline. And so that could contribute a small amount of clay material to the deep ocean. Obviously, we have volcanic ashes. A very, very large volcanic eruption will throw uh, ash over quite a large area. We have these mic we have microfossil residue. So we have bits of shell from these little organisms that live at the top of the water column. Uh, we also have iron oxides, which are contributed by uh, submarine venting. We'll discuss that in just a second. And then every once in a while, you'll get a few other things included, things like meteorite dust, so material actually coming from space. So these pelagic clays are a mixture of very fine material from a range of different sources. And no one source really dominates over the other. So... These pelagic uh, clays are also referred to as red clays, and the red clays comes uh, the, the red color, should I say, comes from a coating of an iron mineral, uh, which helps to stain the rock. Now, initially, the iron mineral is a mineral called limonite, also sometimes referred to as limonite, and it's an iron oxide hydroxide mineral. And the iron that makes up the, the limonite comes mostly from hydrothermal submarine vents. So here we have what's called a black smoker. And this is where we have very, very iron-rich hydrothermal waters, which were circulating around in the, in the oceanic crust, venting onto the seafloor. So this water is extremely hot. It's about 350 Celsius. And it's absolutely stuffed with loads of dissolved uh, minerals, like iron and sulfur and copper and nickel and cobalt. And you can see that by the fact this water is this you know, very dark, grey, cloudy colour. That's all this dissolved material mixed in with it. And a lot of it is going to be iron. And so all of this iron-rich water gets pumped into the deep oceans. And of course, some of the iron will settle and it will crystallise onto the surface of the clay-rich sediments, clay sediments on the seafloor. And so it will form the mineral limonite. You can also get iron being fixed by biogenic processes. You have organisms living in these um, deep ocean clays, and they can also take iron from the seawater and produce crystals of, of limonite as part of that process as well. So you have these two sources, and both of them will contribute limonite to these deep ocean sediments. So what happens is, is during lithification, the process of taking this deep marine mud and turning it into a rock, the limonite will change into the mineral hematite. And hematite has a strong, rusty red colour to it. And so that's where the red colour for these, you know, pelagic sediments comes from. So pelagic clays will typically form in areas where pla planktonic activity is relatively low, because of course, you can't have greater than 30% shell material mixed in with your sediment otherwise it's going to be considered an ooze 
So typically the amount of plankton tends to be a bit lower in the areas where we get these pelagic clay deposits forming. And of course the presence of any particle larger than the silt is obviously due to icebergs. Well, well icebergs should I say releasing material which we refer to as drop stones or maybe a meteorite. That's another possible source for larger material. And so this map kind of shows you what we expect to have. So let's start with the continental marine sediments. So we have them here in this kind of uh, golden creamy yellow color. And this is material that's being eroded off the continents and being deposited into relatively shallow water. So most of this water around here is typically you know, shallower. This is mostly continental shelf environment. So you're looking at water depths of somewhere around zero to 200 meters. So the edge of this line here approximately represents the shelf break. And so we're moving into deeper water in these areas here. So if we look, we can see the plagic clays, which are here in the orange, they tend to form in the middle of ocean basins. Okay, so we can see, especially here in the middle of the Pacific, you know, far, far away from the coast. And that's typically because these areas which tend to be more distant from the coast, they tend to have environments where you have, where it's slightly harder for life to exist in the water column. And so there tends to be fewer plankton around. So this area tends to be more clay dominated. In terms of oozes, we have calcareous oozes and siliceous oozes. So in terms of calcareous oozes, you can see that's the light purple, and you can see that dominates a very substantial portion of the ocean basins. In terms of the siliceous oozes, we have two different types, depending on which siliceous uh, plankton is dominant. So we have radiolarian, so they're a, a plankton uh, they're a very small, you know, single-celled organism that um, has a siliceous shell. And as you can see, that's the medium purple. They like to live here in this equatorial region. Okay. And this area here is very, very um, good for them to live in because, of course, we have a circulation of water in the, in the South Pacific. So we have water that comes across from South America, comes over to Southeast Asia, gets warmed up, and then moves back across. So we have this circulation right there. Okay, and so what we have here is we have all this warm water that's coming from um, Southeast Asia, coming back across the Pacific, and essentially it helps to make the conditions just perfect for the radiolarians to live in this area in quite large concentrations, and so that leads to the formation of these radiolarian-rich oozes, which obviously radiolarians have siliceous shells. In these higher latitude areas, the dark purple here, we have colder water, and this is the type of environment where diatoms like to live. And so these areas here tend to be very, very, you know, tend to be pelagic sediments, very, very rich in, in diatome uh, shell fragments. So diatomes have siliceous shells. So we end up with a diatome siliceous ooze here towards the poles. So you can see that depending on, you know, what type of organism we have, that's going to affect the type of ooze we get. And obviously the types of organism we get are going to be controlled by the environment. Okay, so this is a great place to stop because I've been going on for a bit. So once again, stop the video, get up, have a walk around, take a few minutes, and then when you're ready, come back for part two.